Welcome to episode number 41. I'm your host, Alpha Mike. On this episode, money is the root of all evil, narco. And we're going to talk about the drug trade and how the DEA has fought against it. And what happens to all these people with all this money and what do they get at the end on the next El Police Radio. Money is the root of all evil, narco, or narcotics. Now, of course, the scripture says that. It's in the Bible. Money is the root of all evil, that Christ himself said. <clears throat> and we're going to look at what happens. It's not the art of making money. It's the art of what happens with the money. We're going to talk about some cases that have occurred we're going to talk about a whole lot of people that have been in the narcotics business and uh, today they're dead or in prison. So that's the end game for those that are listening. And we're also going to talk about where are we going. There's a lot to talk about. We're going to talk about, of course, uh, the people that are defending us on the front line, and that is the Drug Enforcement Agency. And they've done a terrific job. And they are the unsung heroes in a lot of this because a lot of what they're doing sometimes is not on the up and up. And that might be a little confusing. You might be saying, well, what are we talking about? But we're going to get into all that. We're going to, let's not rush the train forward before it gets to the next stop. So now we've added on lpoliceradio.com on the upcoming shows. November 14th, 2018. We're up to November 2018th. I just added that uh, this morning. I'm actually recording on a Sunday night. <clears throat> well, that tells you everything. November 14th, 2018, The Plastic Gun. And that show is basically going to be about uh, concealed, concealed carry. And we're going to talk about some... Uh, Bad reputations that have occurred, some myths, and some truths. And that's going to be a good show to look forward to. Just prior to that, on uh, episode 59, the plastic gun is episode 61, 59, which is October 31st, we're actually going to do uh, firearms training. So we're going to have, uh, that'll lead into the uh, plastic gun couple of weeks later. So look forward to it because it's a good topic. It's a hot topic. And uh, there's a lot of stuff going on about uh, concealed carry. Now, we've got a lot on the, on, on the, uh, on the tarmac here that we're going to have to cover. We're going to have to, you know, float up to 35,000 feet. And uh, <clears throat> we're going to look at the drug trade and the obsessed amounts of money that these people are making. Sky's the limit. <clears throat> the power is amazing. And I want everybody to have their pencils, crayons, paper, and cra uh, cardboard boxes ready. Because how many, boys and girls right here, how many 
I truly believe that these narcotic rings do not have any governmental influence anywhere in the world. Anybody? Do not believe that any government is involved. Okay, one hand, that's it. Okay, we'll get to you in a minute. Just for now, just listen. That's the problem. That's why the drug trade is at the levels that are they're in. Because a lot of people actually believe that these people started small, went big, and the governments out there, when I say governments, I'm talking about all governments around the world, are out there tooth and nail trying to catch them. And that's not necessarily true. <clears throat> a lot of them out there, they're in partnership with them. <clears throat> they either eliminate them and put somebody else, but it's a business. And it's a scary business. And the mom, you know, when we I had a show about Costa Nostra, and we talked about how the United States government set up the Costa Nostra in Sicily and set them up in different ports and they made deals with Meyer Lansky and uh, about the ports of New York to watch out for Nazis during the Second World War. So there's nothing strange that the federal government or governments make deals with criminal enterprises. They do more than what, public, what the public really knows. Now, I want to say one thing. Let's not make any crazy notions that drug dealing is something that's supposed to be honorable and you know, Robin Hood type of thing, because it's not. We're going to cover some of stories like that, but it's not. And I want to especially dedicate this show to DEA agent Nikki Camarera that died. He was uh, kidnapped by Mexican police and tortured and put to death. Uh, he was a DEA agent, and there's not one DE, DEA agent on this planet that won't talk about him and his and his greatness because of what he endured. And I would not, I'd be remiss if I get into this show and I talk about all this and I don't mention him. So I do want to say that this show is dedicated on his behalf, and towards the end we will have a moment of silence for Nikki Camarera. But before we all do this, everybody knows the lineup. Put your pencils down, kids. It's time for the L Police Radio News Countdown. One. Well, of course, we have uh, three DEA, DEA stories to talk about in our news segment. Uh, first one up, only on six is the is the headline here. DEA special agent says heroin, synthetic opioid, and main focus for the is the main focus for the agency. Uh, David Zahn is the assistant special agent in charge of the DEA in the Albany District, and that's up in New York. Right now, he says stopping heroin is DEA's management's top priority. One reason for that. He says heroin is now being laced with dangerous synthetic opioid that are killing people. Now that the fentanyl and the senfentanyl are being added to it, what's really got our attention is over the overdose death because of one thing to have addiction is another thing to have dead bodies all over the streets. They're lacing this stuff with all kinds of stuff. They're even making it look like candy, too. So be on the lookout for that. So think about it. This is not a part of the news. I'm, I'm off subject here. A thing called P500. And uh, it can easily confuse kids in thinking that it's candy. So keep on the lookout. So DEA, they're on the hunt for this stuff because it's killing people. Two. Another DEA story. And we've got DEA announces enhanced focus on, uh, on Green Plains Aim State's level largest ever fentanyl bust. DEA announced an enhanced focus on drug 
trafficking in the Great Plains on Thursday with the creation of a new division based out of Omaha. The new division, which will oversee Drug Enforcement Administration work in Nebraska, Iowa, Minnesota, and the Dakotas, comes as the biggest fentanyl bust in Nebraska history heads to federal court. And then it, it goes on and talks about who the suspects are. I won't even mention them not to dignify them. But I picked this story especially because they talk about, look at, look at these states that they're talking about. Uh, Nebraska, Iowa, Minnesota, Dakotas. This ain't high crime rate in areas that the DA is in there busting people. That goes to show you that this thing is a lot bigger than what citizens actually believe. Mm-mm-mm. Number three, where, where, where's the guy? Where, hello, where's she at now? Three. Thanks. You know we got a lot. We got a lot of cover, honey. We, we had to get those one, two, threes out there real quick. So, all right. Now, now we're waiting on me. All right. In the last DEA story, uh, investigators looking at upstate physicians for possible uh, overprescriptions. Three out of four people addicted to heroin stated started with pain medication because of the medication community is now aware of how addictive painkillers can be. The Drug Enforcement Administration is seeking out irresponsible doctors with special task force. David Zion is assistant special agent in charge of the DA Albany District Office. We have multiple cases in all five offices of upstate where we're looking at doctors and physicians. One of the DEA most notable cases in New York is still going through the court system. Buffalo doctor Eugene Gosey is named in a federal indictment accused of illegally issuing hundreds of thousands of prescriptions for opioid, a knucklehead. Dr. Gosey wrote more prescriptions than all the doctors in the state of New York. Amazing. So, of course, yeah, they're trying to stop the addiction because it leads to bigger things, so... I tell you, there are unsung heroes. They're called the DEA, the Drug Enforcement Agency. Uh, okay, where's the bugler now? First it's honey. She's disappeared. Now the bugler. What is he? He's polishing the bugle. All right, hurry up. I think he got too much uh, polish on the uh, trumpet there. Money is the root of all evil, narco. Now, Netflix has um, given a lot of its subscription holders the episode, I believe they're up to episode, not episode, uh, but season four. And they they have given us in this uh, show, Narco, the the dealings of the underworld in dealing in and basically uh, cocaine. A little brief about marijuana, but it talks about mostly the cocaine industry. And they start off with uh, Pablo Escobar. And then they go into the Cali cartel. And so that's uh, seasons one, two, and three. And now season four, they're headed towards Mexico. But before we get into who the players are and what we're trying to really focus on there's a lot of people out there and in some of my review for this episode there's a lot of people on YouTube and Google and so forth that are proclaiming that there is a a specific group or a specific ethnicity of people that truly control the narcotics industry and are making money hand over fist. But I I did research some of that and I did go into the comparison dollar for dollar. So I'm not going to go into all groups because Asians are into narcotics. Uh, we even know that the heroin and the opioid epidemic uh, some of this stuff is being produced from Afghanistan, believe it or not, and it makes its way over to this country. <clears throat> so 
We can get into all kinds of ethnicities that are dealing in drugs, but I specifically picked out the racial profiling, as we call it, uh, hey. the specific group that has been most braggish about making a ton of money. And one of them has been uh, Freeway Rick Ross, and his estimated worth was $900 million. That is a lot of money. He was sentenced to a life in prison for dealing in drugs. His sentence on appeal was reduced. He got out. He's out now. And he claims that the CIA pretty much put him in business to sell and distribute drugs with the purpose of gaining the illicit money so they can move it around, and especially in his case, uh, the guns that were being sold to the Contras in Nicaragua and so forth. So his he's up at $900 million, almost a billion. That's up there. And uh, so he's one of the big, big drug dealers of modern time in the African-American community. Then you go on to uh, the Black Mafia family and Big Minch, and that how that was being supplied is being supplied by a guy by the name of Oscar Blandong, which was from Nicaragua, believe it or not. He was a supplier. He was moving the, the, the cocaine over to uh, primarily Rick Ross and his enterprise, and then beneath him, uh, these people make money too, and this was Big Minch, and he's in there at about $330, $340 million. That's a lot of money too. Then we go into the area of New York City. We were out in the West Coast, and we're going to the East Coast, New York City. There's a guy by the name of Guy Fisher, big drug dealer in Harlem, and he basically created an empire. His empire and his net worth was $300 million. A lot of money. From that organization was born Nicky Barnes. And Nicky Barnes was very famous in the late 60s and 70s in New York City as Mr. Untouchable, as he was called. Still alive today, did a small stint in prison and uh, for his cooperation, because he cooperated with the government, I believe he's 83 years old now, and he's in the witness protection program. But his wealth was at $330 million. That's a lot of money. A lot of money. Then we go into Lester Lloyd Cook, Coke. What an appropriate name, huh? $405 million was his estimated worth. And he was peddling drugs through Jamaica, the Jamaica network or the Jamaican posse. People like Jim Brown and and Burke or Blake were under him, and they were also rich, or not as rich as the 405, but they were up there as well. Then we're going to change it now to the uh, ethnicity of the Colombians. One of them was the cocaine, and there's a, Another documentary on Netflix on that, Cocaine Cowboy, with Grisela Blanco. And she had an estimated worth of $1 billion, and she was part of the Medellin cartel. Now, <clears throat> she was a distributor. In other words, she received the product in America and distributed it outwards. Now... When we're, we're at the Colombians now, so now is when it's going to start the balloon with some ridiculous amounts of, of money. And and some of these figures are, are just mind-boggling. And people or society always want to know, who's the top dog? Who's, where's the money end? Well, you can't really tell who where the money ends because they're still counting it. And they'll be counting that money for a long, long time to come. But what I can tell you is you have to also look at the error we're talking about. And specifically, I'm talking about an era in the 1980s or early 80s 
it's when the cocaine really ballooned and blossomed in, in America and especially in Miami. And through that era, the amounts of money of money laundering were outrageous. I mean, th this is something that nobody was ready for. No, I don't think the government was really ready for it. I don't think uh, the banking industry was ready for it. Nobody was ready for this amount of money. But nevertheless, it was there, and people were making uh, a lot of money as a result of this uh, as illicit uh, uh, narcotics. When we look primarily at the cocaine drug trade, we look at one person, and that is Pablo Escobar. Pablo Escobar being started as a criminal in the late 70s, uh, pickpocketing, a couple of small little drug deals. And once he found out who had the supply of cocaine, he asked, you know, can you sell me a couple of kilos of that? About 14 kilos, I think it was. And they belittled him as a small little trafficker, but they sold it to him. And he went and he doubled his money. So then instead of going back and asking for more, he just killed the opposition. That's all. He took over. And one of the things he creates, his enterprise creates the, the distribution of cocaine in the world. The routes, the money, how the money comes back. And the amount of money that he was estimated as his worth was $30 billion. And there's somewhere I saw uh, Narco, I believe it was, where he was generating every 30 seconds $24,000. I'll repeat that for you, for the kids in the back, if you're writing this. Every 30 seconds. And how much is 30 seconds? Okay, that's right. That's a half a minute. He was making $24,000. So but the amount of money was outrageous. Uh, you, you just can't, you don't even know how to spend that. But one of the things is he greased a lot of pockets. A lot of people became rich. The, the killing sprees were out outrageous, but uh, there's an estimate uh, from the famous uh, hitman in the Midian cartel, uh, Popeye, and I'll link his YouTube uh, channel. Believe it or not, he has a YouTube channel on lpoliceradio.com. He served 23 years, I believe, in a Colombian prison for all the murders that he admitted to, somewhere in the area of 250, 300 of them. And he was Pablo Escobar, one of his chief hitmen. Uh, he estimated that they killed in, in, in or around 3,000 police officers and over 50,000 people died as a result of Pablo Escobar's hand in Colombia and around the world. 50,000 people. So all this money now is creating all this murder so we can continue receiving the money in order to continue the business. And then we got to involve a lot of people that never thought that they'd be involved in a drug enterprise, but now they are. And they're cleaning and funneling and moving large amounts of money. People are being, every day, because of this money, are being tempted by the amounts of money. If you're a pilot, if you can create a smuggling ring, <coughs> if you can distribute it in a certain area, you can make it big. And if you have a way of sneaking it in, you, you want, forget the lottery. You're it. Because the money will start to flow. And that's 
how this enterprise works. The, the addiction is so large, it's mind-boggling how people need this drug. So they're losing everything. They're selling everything in order to continue the habit. And it's mind-boggling the amounts of money. It's being filtered through different layers. And just think about it. That the guy that's distributing it was estimated worth of $30 billion. $30 billion. And and we don't even know if he's the biggest one. I mean, now, now, I do want to say this. To put it in perspective, the $30 billion that he was, uh, his net worth, that was in the 80s, late 80s, okay? Let's put this in perspective. Imagine what those $30 billion would represent today. So this this amount of money is, remember what we say on El Police Radio all the time, a gazillion. It, it, it's, it's, it's an amount of money you can never reach. You can't even think about it. So for a guy that was a peasant, he was a poor, uh, you know, farm, uh, farm kid. And all of a sudden he's got all this money. And it is outrageous. But let's go in a little bit deeper. Because one of the things that Pablo Escobar created was narco-terrorism. Terror, because he terrorized people if they didn't participate in what he wanted. So he blew up buildings. He created the car bomb. He blew up airplanes. He didn't care. So he created fear. Fear in the Colombian people. And he was one of the world's first narco-terrorists that they created so much fear. One of the DEA agents that were involved in his uh, capture and, of course, death because he sh shot it out with the Colombian police. And, you know, there, there's been reports while well, he killed himself on the roof and blah, 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 he didn't kill, the cops killed him, the Colombian police officers, because he had killed so many of them. There was a vendetta to get him. So they did. And the bottom line is that uh, he created fear, so much fear, that when he died, there was a sense of relief by many citizens of Colombia. Although at his funeral, 25,000 people showed up. A lot of them peasants that he gave money to. But a lot of poor people. See, he was creating the Robin Hood effect. He had so much money, he'd have his lieutenant just hand out $100 bills on street quarters and give money to people. So they thought he was the best thing to slice bread. Forget about what he's doing. But what he started to do was atrocious behavior. Now, let's dig in a little deeper. And let's look at some of the empire that came with it. Now, before we get in deeper with, with names and people and so forth, most likely I'm going to mention a couple of names that you've never heard of. And I know there's always people that I know all about this. I saw a documentary. So I know all about it. But there's going to be a couple of names that I probably mentioned you've never heard of. And they were big in the narcotics business. But I want to take a second... And I want to start talking about how did this all become, okay? Let's, let's drive back into the history. Let's talk about the law enforcement agency that is tasked with fighting against this narco-terrorism and narcotics, period, is the Drug Enforcement Agency. Well, in response to America's growing drug problem, Congress passed the Controlled Substance Act, okay, entitled to of the Comprehensive Drug Abuse Prevention and Control Act in 1970. Thus, the foundation of the Drug Enforcement Agency was created. So the DEA actually is created in 1973, but what lays the foundation is this uh, Controlled Substance Act. So prior to 
it was the Bureau of Narcotics. But Congress wanted the DEA to go a little deeper. They didn't just want to go after uh, illegal substances. <clears throat> they also wanted the DEA to control drugs. Okay, so it was more of a control law enforcement agency. Remember the stories that I read earlier before we started with the media uh, segments. We talked about how they're investigating doctors for writing too many prescriptions. So this is a control type of act, and it's the creation of the DEA as a result. Basically, they declare the war on drugs. Now, you've heard several presidents declare it. One of them was Richard Nixon. And they go out and they start making drug busts. There are some legendary drug enforcement agents. And I'm going to post on lpoliceradio.com two web interviews that I did uh, with, with uh, drug enforcement agents. And one of them being Mike Levine. And he'll talk a little bit, and there's a couple of books he wrote. Fascinating stuff. Fascinating stuff. And But let, let, let's, let's keep on digging here. Let's keep on writing. And kids in the back, don't fall asleep on me. Pay attention here. All right, so in uh, August 5th, 1974, there was a tragedy that occurred in Miami where the DEA office building crashed, killing seven and trapping others. It was devastating. Between 125 and 150 people were working in the building at the time. And uh, the training, uh, they, the National Training Institute, the DEA's first training program, was located at its headquarters, okay, because there, there wasn't enough real funding to create anything else other than that. But going back to the issue that occurred in Miami, it was one of the first devastating acts that occurred to the DEA. And they have been a law enforcement agency which has really, really paid the price in many, many ways. <clears throat> Not only have their de DEA agents uh, been tortured, killed, and, and gone through a lot, some of them have been disowned by their own agency once they retire because they're the bearer of many secrets. So this has not been a glamorous thing for a lot of them. But let's continue looking. I want to focus a, a second on the, the amount of training they needed. We're somewhere in the area of 1974 now. So uh, as the government usually has a lucky streak about them, they're not going to really finance you with all the bells and whistles. So the DEA is forced to create a training center at their headquarters. They got a, an old bank, and they I guess they bought the property, and they converted that into the training center. But they're walking into now something that really... Law enforcement in America has never done at the magnitude of the drug enforcement agency. Uh, they have done nickel dime, a uh, small little bust out in the street, undercover operations, but not at the magnitude that they were trying to bring down people like Pablo Escobar. So this is a, a new realm for them. While they're training, they're learning. And they have to perfect their craft. And, of course, they've done an excellent job. So we go into the 80s and 90s where we're bringing down the cartels. The objective of everybody now that's in this illicit industry, if you can create a direct path from distributor to America, you have just made a gazillion dollars. And as a result, a lot of people did do it. And one of them was uh, El Chapo, as we have, you probably have heard him being mentioned. He created the roots underneath the checkpoints 
along the border of the United States and Mexico. And this is, is an ongoing problem today. And not as, of course, when he started creating tunnels, he was passing hundreds and hundreds and of tons of cocaine through there. It made him a fortune. But he wasn't the only guy. Now, we're going to start reading some names here. But before we get into that, we're going to talk about the queen of the cocaine. Now, for a lot of people, the queen of the cocaine could be uh, who I read earlier as uh, Blanca, which is uh, she created her uh, empire in Miami, Los Angeles, and so forth. But even though they regarded her and there was nicknamed her that, she was really a distri- she, she was to, her job was to distribute the product for the Medellin cartel, which she was a part of in America. And that's what she did. And she made a billion dollars for that. Of course, uh, after she did a couple of prison stints and all that, and she, she went back to Colombia at the age of 66 or 67 or something like that uh, for her hard work and dedication, she, she was shot in the head, and, she, and they killed her, uh, the cartels themselves. But there was another lady out of Bolivia by the name of Sonia de Alta. Now, she created the production of cocaine in laboratories in Bolivia. Now, during the 70s, in the, in the country of Chile, Pinochet was a very ruthless dictator, and there were crime labs or cocaine labs uh, that were so in, in the area of Chile, and technicians, scientists, and so forth. But Pinochet had um, a rehabilitation program that he had set up. It was called the Bullet. And uh, if you were arrested in Chile under Pinochet for dealing in drugs or creating of drugs, you were put to death. So people fled, and a lot of them fled to Bolivia. And in Bolivia, they created these laboratories, and the Bolivian government itself in the early 70s was in the drug business saying that they would mass produce this, making a lot of money and selling it to every American they could. And Sonia de Alta was one of those individuals, and she was known as the queen of cocaine. She later becomes a government a witness, and she's currently in the witness protection program, age is 60-something, 60 64, 65. And, um, but she's still alive today. She made gazillions, and Pablo Escobar uh, himself was giving her the name uh, the queen of cocaine because he was asking, now he wasn't asking for kilos, he was asking for tons. And the tons were being produced by this woman's operation. To him, he was paying and doubling in his profits, and business was good as a result of that. So our first gillionaire is going to be Sonia de Alta, okay? Estimated worth, nobody knows. She's a witness protection program. Pablo Escobar bought $30 billion until he was gunned down. Then, Jose Gonzalo Rodriguez Gancha. Who is he? Well, he's an individual. He was a Colombian drug lord. This was the guy that had the army, the arsenals. They called him El Mexicano. He was just as rich as Pablo Escobar, but he... People feared him, okay? There was a difference between him and Escobar. People feared Gancha or El Mexicano. They feared him. And on Pablo Escobar, at the time, he was 
mostly into the cell and distribution. He wasn't as feared. They both knew each other. They, they both uh, worked together. But the power was El Mexicano. And he wasn't Mexican, by the way. He was Colombian. So Jose Gonzalo Rodriguez Cancha was a Colombian. He was called El Mexicano because he had an, a, a, a fascination with the ethnicity of the Mexicans. He would wear Mexican hats and listen to Mexican music, and uh, he would have ranches in Colombia and so forth. So uh, they nicknamed him the Mexican. But he had the power. He controlled by pure fear. And uh, he was gunned down in 1989 and in a shootout with police in in Colombia, and that was the end of him. So that power base now is transferred over to Pablo Escobar. Escobar had money, but he never had the power that El Mexicano had. So uh, you can dwell a little bit on that. The Cali cartel comes in now. They come up with an elaborate program of espionage listening. They want to know what the government knows. They are more businessmen. They were known as Los Caballero de Cali. They were the gentlemen of Cali, okay? They try to run their operation like a Fortune 500. Of course, the outcome, they um, are sitting in prison cells. That was their outcome. There were some more in Colombia cartels that were created uh, from 1990 to 2012 uh, in Norte uh, del Valle in Colombia cartel and, uh, and the North Coast cartel, which kind of died in the, around 2004. Uh, so they're smaller groups now. Now, remember, boys and girls, I said, if you could create the pathway from product to intended country or selling point, in this case is the good old USA, you will become a gazillionaire. Well, our gazillionaire is called Amando Criello Fuentes, the Lord of the Skies, El Señor de los Cielos. And he basically created a whole lot of money Okay, and he was flying, flying the shipments, okay, through, um, he was flying the shipments through uh, Colombia to Mexico, landing them in Mexico, and that made him a whole lot of money. Um, he becomes a drug lord. Now, he is Mexican, is a drug, is a Mexican drug lord. Now we're going into the beginning of the transfer from Colombia to Mexico. Mexico, Colombia, excuse me, still has the product. Mexico now wants the product and they are determined to get it through the U.S. Now El Chapo does it through tunnels, but this guy... Armando Criello Fuentes, el, el, el Señor de los Cielos, the Lord of the Skies, he has an, an array of a fleet of Air Force airplanes, and he is flying tons of it into small little airfields in the U.S. and basically setting up his cartel, making a whole lot of money. His cartel still exists today. His estimated worth uh, was $25 billion, and that would be mostly up until his death in 1997. Uh, he dies, of course, because the occupation calls for uh, uh, trying to elude law enforcement and he went on, he underwent plastic surgery that changed his appearance and so forth. Uh, but the, during the operation, he died. And uh, that was his complication. 
But this guy was on the road to making a lot more money than he had, um, which was estimated at $25 billion. It continues going from there. The, the cartels, and uh, we can mention names, the Gulf Cartel, the Sinaloa Cartel. Uh, I've even posted on uh, El Police Radio on the show notes uh, for uh, episode 41, the drug cartels of the world. They're all there. You can look them up. You can see uh, what's what. But we want to wrap it up. I, I was originally thinking about doing this show into uh, two shows. But uh, I said, no, I, we can get all the meat and potatoes out. It might be a little longer than we wanted to, but we can get all the meat and potatoes out. Look, the bottom line is whether it's heroin, cocaine, marijuana, or whatever the illicit drug is, don't fool yourself. These governments have pushed this stuff, peddled this stuff, have received heavily amounts of money. This is why the drug trade in Mexico will no, not, not go away anytime soon because they are governmental officials making a gazillion dollars uh, from the cartel. It's unfortunate that the Mexicans are making the same mistakes that the Colombian cartels made and Pablo creating narco-terrorism and scaring the public. Currently, you can go and Google uh, Acapulco, Mexico, and it'll tell you, it'll give you a list of uh, tourists that were killed. Uh, the Mexican cartels now are gunning down tourists in the streets of Acapulco and other areas uh, because they are upset that the government of Mexico is hampering their drug trade. So you hamper my business, I hamper yours, which is tourism. And this is what's going on. They're making the same mistakes that Pablo Escobar uh, created in Colombia, and his outcome was death. And it might take a little longer because the corruption in Mexico is mammoth. It, it is... Uh, you, you can't even put a statistic to it. It's, it's just too big of a number. So it's going to take a while. But it, eventually, it's all going to come crumbling down because it cannot stand on its own merit. We look and we continue to see how other countries now are becoming involved in the drug trade. Afghanistan producing heroin and and sneaking it through here. There's even an article, um, which I will try to find, where the Obama administration, the president himself at the time, President Obama, told the DEA, relax your investigation that you have on some Iranian guys because it's messing up my negotiation with Iran. They were dealing in heroin. They were trying to bring the heroin into the U.S., in order to funnel that money back to Iran. And the government of Iran told the president of the United States, hey, can you let, uh, you know, look the other way? My guys are trying to make some money. This is how bad it's getting. So to sit here and think that the United States government is not involved in any of this is wrong. The governments have been involved all along. That's why it exists, folks. It exists because they are allowing it to exist. Yes, there are very powerful people moving a lot of material and a lot of money, but so is the government making a lot of money also. So money is the root of all evil. It brings nothing good, and the only thing that it will bring is bad news. Nothing good can become of it. I can tell you that. I can go on with a list of names. We've posted some of them on lpoliceradio.com. I'm sure there are people out there with their hands raised saying, ooh, 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 don't forget, and this guy and that guy. and that. We, we can call drug dealers' names out all day long. But that's not the point of the, the episode. The point of the episode is, look at all the money they made. $30 billion shot dead like a dog on the roof in a Colombian slum. That was the outcome of Pablo Escobar. Or a lot of these other guys that went to prison. 
all those riches and all those um, experiences that they had as a result of the illicit drug trade, what did they get for it at the end? Misery. Sons that were killed, pe daughters, families assassinated, people gone to prison. It brought misery to their lives. So there are a lot of people that think that the drug business is glamorous because of the money. But our Lord has said, money is the root of all evil. And if it comes from God, it's 100% on target. So let's start breaking into our segment, the 09 Training Tip. I want to take a moment and have a little shout out to my friend Jay Dobbins, which I had the pleasure of interviewing him on uh, Latino Police Radio many years ago, and his under his book about his undercover role in the Hell's Angels, and um, I might have said earlier um, mixed him up as a DEA agent as well, but he was part of the Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. ATF, and I uh, want to give him a shout out because they have a training group that uh, I definitely would like to to uh, talk about, of course, uh, later on as we move along, which is called Catching Hell, and uh, it's, I believe, a three-day program, and we'll post that on lpoliceradio.com, uh, but I, what I want to talk about today in this uh, 09 training trait segment on uh, training is the debriefing process because uh, one of the things that I've really looked at and looking at some of the background information that I needed for this show and some other episodes that are coming down the road, um, when you're in the undercover role, you can lose yourself in that role. And you have to be well-rounded. We look now that there's an upsurge in suicide. We look now that there's a, a little, the, the needle's moving upwards in suicide amongst law enforcement officers. We also look at it, um, there's a, a higher number now of medical professionals doctors, nurses, uh, and so forth, also committing the act of suicide. Debriefing in law enforcement is something that is so, so much needed. If you are in law enforcement right now, see if your agency has a program for debriefing incidents. Don't go with the stigma of an incident. Listen, it's happened in the military. It's real. It's not fictional. There is a thing as post-traumatic syndrome that you carry around for your whole entire life. Officers are coming down with this syndrome. They've always have, but they've never been officially recognized up until recently. There's a real battle. Uh, I had the, the opportunity of reading an article of the Pulse nightclub in Orlando, Florida, one of the first responders uh, is seeking, well, he's suing his old former agency because he says he suffers from post-traumatic syndrome of looking at 49 bodies, you know, shot and killed. And he's also looking for it to become a part of state legislation. And it, the battle's all around the country, just not in one specific place. All around the country, law enforcement officers are fighting for this. But while they fight for it to become a state statute, I want you to take the opportunity and fight to make sure that's in your agency. If it's not, encourage the supervisors through a nice professional email or memorandum. Ask them for a debriefing type session with a psychologist. Why? 
because it's for your own mental health. Sometimes, believe it or not, your agency really doesn't care. I think you're a little bit of a robot and that you're going to continue doing what they want you to do. But there are such things as mental health days that you can't. I know I did for 27 years. There were times where I froze. I just couldn't make another step. My mind was completely blanked out. And if I didn't have one or two days to myself, I would have been the end of my career. Debriefing in large agencies is more prevalent. Smaller agencies, sometimes you got to go around in circles to find out. If your insurance carries it, then look for it. Look at it as a, self, as a sense of well-being for yourself. You cannot continue to serve the community if you can't continue to serve yourself. So our message on the 09 training trip today, well-being and your own debriefing process over any incident. What's a major incident? One that keeps you up at night. Now let's get on the motorcycle and head towards the conversation. What kind of relationship can light have with darkness? None. Because where there is light, there is no more darkness. Well, where do I find that? I find that in Scripture. Our Lord Jesus has told us that money is the root of all evil. And he wasn't thinking of necessarily narco-terrorism. He was thinking about your own soul and what creates sinful behavior. Money is a catalyst. It produces that behavior because you don't have any worries about paying for whatever illicit thing you want to do. That's why the Lord pointed it out. But he, what he's really telling us is that when you do have money, there's great responsibility that comes with it. It's so important to be rooted in a spiritual light. As I said, the light overcomes the darkness. If you're in darkness now and you have difficulty seeing which way you're going, I encourage you to go towards the light. What is the light? Well, it's the love of the cross. It's the one that died for you and for me that will forgive you of your sins if you ask for them. And he is graceful enough and merciful enough to carry you into your journey, into the future, up to salvation in heaven. It is so important if you're in that dark area where you can't see to ask for a light. Believe me, ask him. Jesus is faithful to provide that light. What's up next? Well, we did uh, 41, of course. If we go in numerical sequence, 42 is next. And we always have, you know, uh, as I said earlier today, our list now is up to uh, November, November 14th. We're going to have the, the show, The Plastic Gun, as I said in the beginning. So creating content. I'm, I'm, when, when I post something, that means I've already dealt in the research. So I know that I can produce an hour show. So imagine that. Uh, I'm up to uh, November, and this is uh, June, uh, the week of June 27th. So a lot of things, a lot of things uh, on the agenda. But uh, what comes up next? We're going to read the, the July hit list. July 4th is number 42 episode, and that is same old, the same old procedure. Put on the uniform, get in the car, patrol the district, write the same reports, do the tickets, 
bang on the cell door, feed the inmates, whatever you, it is you're doing. And we're going to talk about the same O and an itch that occurs because of the same O at 7, 14, 21, and possibly 28 years of service, you get an itch. 43 episode, Suspicious Minds, July 11th. Suspicious Minds. Is he going to talk about detectives? No. We're going to talk about the high rate of divorce in law enforcement. Episode 44, In the Ghetto, July 18th. How difficult it is to patrol the areas that are ghettos, barrios, areas that are high crime ridden. How long do I have to be there? Why me? Where's everybody else? We're going to talk about that. And episode 45 will conclude the July lineup. Oath of office, the 25th of July. A lot of us raise our hand in excitement and we take the oath. But what in exactly does it mean when you take an oath? That's our lineup for July. Folks, we got a lot of things on the agenda, and I'm, I'm really getting into these things. Uh, again, a one-hour show produces about two hours of research, two or three hours of research. Editing after the radio show is another couple of hours. It kind of puts me at uh, two days, two and a half days. And if I punch out two of these or three of these in a week, well, you start doing the math. This becomes a business. What am I doing? Am I trying to get a gazillion members to come on El Police Radio on one show? No. We're producing library content. Everything you want to know about law enforcement and the aspects of law enforcement and the elements of law enforcement come through these shows. So we encourage you to come on board, go to lpoliceradio.com, become a subscriber, a member, listen to the show, go to iTunes, Stitcher, wherever you can find it, lpoliceradio.com. And you can Google it. And, and I think it comes up pretty relatively on the first page now. We're getting there. And... We're also going to start integrating. Don't forget, kids, after our September uh, 11th, I believe it is, show, we're going, and that's our anniversary show, we're going to start bringing in the 09 segments into El Police Radio. So there'll be a show of about a half hour to 45 minutes on a training subject. So we're going to really start diving into training. Uh, when those shows come, that they'll be once a month at least, uh, we're going to change the format for those shows. A little bit different than we do now. Now, what do we do? Uh, I give you a little heads up of what's coming on. We do the three news articles. We go into the meat and potatoes. We do the 09 training tip, conversation, and what's up next. But when we do the 09 training, we're going straight to training, and we're going to conclude in training. So keep that in mind. And that's coming after the uh, September 11th show. So, folks, it's been my pleasure and my honor. We, I encourage you, please, uh, hook up to us on the social networking. You can see us on lpoliceradio.com. Scroll all the way down the bottom. You see the social networks. I am on um, Twitter at Alpha Mike, small little letters, Alpha Mike, twenty. Oh, uh, 17, 2017, oh, one word, Alpha Mike 2017. And there I post a lot of the stuff that we're going to be talking about in the future. So a lot of my posts have something to do with the episode that's coming. And, of course, you can always reach out to us on El uh, Police Radio on Twitter as well. Now, before we break away, I want to honor Enrique Kiki Camarena and a little bit about who he was. Enrique S. Kiki Camarena Salazar, born 26 July 1947 and died 9 February 1985, was a Mexican-born American undercover agent of the United States Drug Enforcement Agency who was abducted on 
7 February 1985, and then tortured and murdered while on assignment in Mexico. Camarena's nickname was Kiki. Served in, prior to the Drug Enforcement Agency, the United States Marine Corps, 1973 to 1975. Police Radio.